So when you took over the Yankees in 1996, one of your first meetings in spring training, you looked around the clubhouse and you told the players, this is a team that can win it all. Paul O'Neill has told me about that scene. David Cohn has told me about that scene. Why were you so confident to say those words to those players at that time? Jack, I was a nervous wreck, man. You know, you, I had a little time to spend with pitchers and catchers, but I knew that the first, uh, you know, all in meeting with when the regulars showed up was going to have to be the meeting that was going to uh, leave an impression on them as far as what I was about. Uh, and I, I, I was very nervous because I knew how important that meeting was. Uh, I, I really, you know, called upon my, you know, I had to certainly forget about my record. I was 100 games under 500 as a manager and been, you know, fired by three different teams. And, uh, but I, you know, I, I was confident I could do the job. It was just a matter of, and being a New Yorker certainly helped because one thing about New Yorkers, uh, you know, you can, you can talk a good game, but you've got to show them what, you know, what you're made of and, and, and what you can do. So, uh, and I was thinking of other sports, Jack. I was thinking about teams win Super Bowls or the NBA championship. And, you know, a lot of those teams never showed up again. Uh, because they spent the time just, you know, in the glory, bathing in the glory of what they accomplished. And I, I wanted more than that, uh, especially being with the Yankees and what the Yankees history tells you they're used to doing and uh, the expectations. And the one thing I hit on, and it was based on my thoughts as far as other sports teams when they win and and you know this past year uh, may have been the boston red sox you know i mean last year the boston red sox it looked like they were digging in for the long haul and then all of a sudden they never even get to the playoffs this uh, this last year uh, you just celebrate it. It, it it's something a goal you set for yourself when you accomplish it you, you sort of exhale and you're not allowed to do that so i uh, I knew my meeting, you know, basically I know a couple of things I said that every single one of my coaches uh, have been to a World Series and I haven't. Uh, and, you know, other than buying a ticket and and then the, the one thing I and I again, you, you say things and you feel you need to say things. And then I've, I've heard players, as you said, you talked to Paul O'Neill and he remembers certain things. Uh, I remember saying, I, uh, I don't want to win one World Series. I want to win three in a row. And, it, you know, I had planned to say that just to let them know that, yeah, you win one, but not that anybody can do it because it certainly it took me generation before I got to it. Uh, but the fact that you really want to verify what you just did. So I said, we went three in a row. And as it turned out, we, we did win and almost four in a row, but that certainly wasn't, you know, what I was thinking when I said that, I just wanted to let them know that even though you win, you still have to come back out there and do it again. Joe, you mentioned that three in a row, Yankees win in 98, 99, and 2000. And as you said, almost won in 2001. But no team since that three-peat has even won back-to-back -back championships. So that three-peat has even grown, I think, in impact over the last 20 years or so. How do you evaluate it? When you go back and look at what those teams did, how do you judge it? Well, it was something special, uh, but again, it, it's, uh, you know, you have to have the right makeup, uh, and I had a ball club, and you've been around them long enough to realize that they stayed hungry. Uh, they never stopped to admire what they had accomplished. Uh, the one thing that I felt I could do was in, in the spring, well, actually, the, the spring of 97, 
uh, after we won in 96, uh, you ran spring training in the exact same way. You know, you weren't going to go bathe in the glory of what, look what we just did. So uh, we tried to stay the course, did all the, the boring things in spring training, cut off, you know, hit the cutoff man, relays, run down plays, all the things that uh, you, you assume everybody knows, but you don't take it for granted by not thinking you have to cover it. So, you know, I know 97 hurt a great deal. Uh, I had trouble uh, really peeling Bernie Williams off to the steps in Cleveland, you know, when he made the last out that day and Paul O'Neill was in another zone when he was at second base and I went out, I thought he had hurt himself when he slid in the second on the double. And he said, Skip, I thought it was out. I thought it was out, Skip. I thought it was out. So it, it, this was a different a group than I've ever, you know, been involved with. They, they, they were riveted in what they needed to do, and um, they, they, they were hell-bent on, on doing it. Joe, so your first year as manager was also Derek Jeter's first full season in the major leagues. He comes to New York. He's a 21-year-old shortstop starting for the Yankees. We all know the stories about how there was some chatter in spring training. Is he ready? Is he not ready? And you said, too late. He's our shortstop. How quickly did it become apparent to you that uh, this kid was built for center stage? Well, uh, I tell you, it happened before I even met him, to be honest with you. Uh, I remember the media when I was talking about, you know, looking to the spring training of 96, and I said, Derek Jeter will be our shortstop. And, uh, and then I happened to be watching the news one night. This is before we went to spring training. And, you know, they – posed the question to him about, you know, you're going to be the shortstop. And his response was much better than mine because uh, he said that I'm going to get an opportunity uh, to play shortstop. Uh, in other words, you get a chance to win, this, to win the job. And that, that sort of stuck with me. And, and then all spring when he, as you said, you know, you mentioned he, he struggled. There's no question. He struggled. But I never saw any – panic in them at all and that's really unusual especially you know you're in New York and the expectations are so high but Derek was so and still is you know very comfortable in his own skin that uh, you know whatever was going to be you know the result of spring training you know he was going to accept it uh, but when well, you're right when we got toward the end and there, there was some chatter about you know, we can send him out and make a deal. We had this extra pitcher. What's his name? Mariano Rivera. That's right. We can make a trade. I, you know, I said, you know, I basically, my opinion was you can always send them out. You know, it doesn't have to be now, uh, but let's start the season and see what happens. And uh, of course he showed us what happened. First, first game, it's a home run, makes a, makes a back to the, you know, to the field catch and left center field. And, you know, we're off to the races. You also mentioned Mariano Rivera. I thought early in 1996, you used the perfect word to describe having him in the bullpen. You called him indispensable. What type of weapon was Mariano for you? Not only in 96, where he played a different role as a setup man, but then also when he becomes closer and going forward from there. Well, Jack, it was interesting because, you know, and when we hit on that formula, and I, I, can't, I can't tell you today when that started, uh, but, you know, I, I, I became brilliant, man. I only had to manage for six innings. <laughs> and then Mariano would pitch the seventh and the eighth, and then, you know, Wetland would get you on the edge of your seat once in a while and, you know, and watch him finish it up. Uh, he was indispensable. It felt like he pitched every day. Uh, and and he just never never disappointed. Uh, then fast forward, you know, Wetland goes to free agency. We we say, yeah, I you know I, I I'd certainly be willing to take a shot with Mariano as the closer because he pitched in so many key situations during the course of the '96 season. And you know he stumbled. He stumbled around a little bit uh, starting the season. And I remember 
You know, the one game against uh, Oakland had, at Yankee Stadium, he, he pitched to the same hitter twice. And that's, that, that's not indicative of a successful closer. And I remember saying to him, because uh, he was really down in the mouth, and I, I said, you know what? I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's yours. So, you know, you just uh, pitch it up and go after it. And um, he certainly showed us what he was made of. You know, before 1996, you mentioned it earlier, it had been more than 4,000 games for you as a player and a manager not getting to a World Series. You had a dis great description once. You said used to be like watching everybody else eat an ice cream sundae, and, and, and you weren't allowed to have a bite. You get there in 96. You win in 98, 99, and 2000. 20 years later, we're going back and, and talking about that run. How much pride, how much emotion, how much joy oozes out of your pores when, when you get the chance to reflect on those years? Yeah, you know, I, I, it, I still get goosebumps. You're talking about it now. Because you never lose the connection with those players. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, I get a chance to see, uh, you know, Clay Bellinger now because of his son, what he's knocking it out in the National League. Uh, you know, and he was in the family room with my daughter, you know, when you, when you think about that. But there's a connection that doesn't go away when you win a championship and you know, these players that are included in it. And, of course, the core four, um, you can't say enough about, you know, Posada, even though he wasn't a roster guy that first year. Uh, you know, after that, he certainly was a huge part of what we did. I, you know, I think, you know, if you count postseason for him and for Pettit, uh, those are Hall of Fame numbers when you watch how they played under pressure. And uh, it, it, it's, it was just unbelievable. And, of course, you know, Derek and, and uh, it, it, was, it, it was pretty special to see those guys year in and year out uh, maintain the hunger they had to go out there and, and, and you know, beat people. Joe, you've mentioned the hunger a couple of times. You and I both know there are very talented teams that sometimes never even get to a World Series. But you had talented teams who delivered. Beyond the talent and, and the hunger, were there other factors that stood out for you that, that made those teams so special? Character. Character. They, they never panicked. I mean, I, you know, they, they tried like crazy sometimes. I mean, it was like, getting blood from a, from a stone there, like even in 2001, trying to score a run or trying to clinch it in 2000 when we basically backed in the winning the division and we won 80 something games. Uh, but it, it was a, a group of, a group of grownups that showed up every day and, and, you know, and went out there and we're going to do their job. You know, Derek, Derek was the leader. There, there's no question in my mind. It's even the veterans and during that 96 season were looking for him once August came around. They were looking for Derek to do something, you know, instrumental in that game that, the, that we were playing. And, you know, he certainly didn't disappoint. They weren't afraid to fail, Jack. Uh, yeah, it's nice to, to get the confidence of winning on a regular basis. But you know what the formula is. And the formula is don't take anything for granted. That 98 season was magical. I mean, we just <clears throat> we just never lost. I mean, you know, we lost, what, first three out of four games or four out of five games, whatever it was. But it, it was crazy. It, it, it was you go out there and you – the patience, and, and you can't appreciate it unless you, you're in that dugout and realize that these guys never lost their focus and that, you know, I, I just felt very fortunate to, you know, be able to ride that horse. You know, I know Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig aren't here to uh, fight for their team, and it's difficult to compare generations. We could, we could do some simulated games on the computer, but since you brought up the 1998 Yankees, do you consider them the best team of all time? I, I think so. Uh, you know, what we accomplished. And again, we didn't have, 
<clears throat> excuse me, we didn't have any slam dunk all stars all the time. Uh, I mean, even nine. I mean, ninety six probably because it was my first championship. That was the club that I, I think I'll always be close to because of the biting and scratching. And I remember George, yeah, about halfway through the season, said, "I don't know how you're doing it. You're doing it with mirrors or something." Because you know how he used to like to to beat teams up. Uh, you know, we were winning by a run here, a run there, a squeeze play, which certainly was indicative, wasn't indicative, and George didn't want it to be of who the Yankees were. You know, he, he liked the, the big boppers. And, you know, and then, of course, you know, we get Strawberry and Cecil Fielder, and it sort of changed our personality. But uh, they, they, they were a 98 club. And not only the fact that we won 114 games, because that was surpassed a couple of years later by uh, by Seattle, but the fact that we went into postseason and had to get through Cleveland, you know, after playing a sloppy game two here and losing game three to them uh, in the post and postseason, to go back and and come out and just you know win the whole thing. I mean that. You talk about pressure, you know, that and and also beating the Mets in 2000. Uh, it, it, it wasn't a whole lot of fun until it was over with. All right, Joe, I'm going to intensify the pressure of this interview. I've interviewed a couple right. of your players, and I've played a little game with them where I ask them the first word or phrase or anecdote that pops to their mind when I mention a name. So I did this with a couple of your guys. I have to say... Bernie Williams, what jumps to mind for you? Uh, <laughs> leader. <clears throat> now, it, I, it shocked him when I told him he was a leader. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you go out there and play every day. You know, that, that, that was indicated. You know, Bern, Bernie willed himself to win, but, but he, he was a leader. Um, um, uh, and and he fit right into what Don Mattingly used to call him Bambi, because that that's you know he he was a glider he he was really special but he was a leader when you know when I know I can count on putting him in the lineup every single day that that that's a good indication for me. How about a lefty that you relied on a lot and pitched a lot of big postseason games, Andy Pettit? Andy Pettit was magic for me. Uh, when I first saw him prepare for games, uh, I thought he was scared to death. Uh, so he'd be sitting there in the trainer's room staring. And then when you, you know, watched how he went out on the mound, and even though he was, you know, sort of a type A personality, really uh, trying to harness stuff, uh, when he had to make a play, you know, you've seen him come off the mound, even though he wasn't the most uh, – uh, you know, he wasn't a gazelle. I mean, he'd come off and make a play. Um, and then when I took him out, he, if looks could kill, man, I tell you what, I can't tell you how many times Jackie used to come in my office before he went home on the days he pitched that didn't finish and apologize for showing me up. I said, you keep showing me up the way you think you're showing me up. I never want you to come out of a game, but uh, he was special. You're inextricably linked because 1996 was the first full season for both of you. How would you describe Derek Jeter? Uh, horse, man. He was, he was the guy you could ride. Um, he, he could go five for five, Jack. If we lost the game, he'd be an unhappy camper. I can tell you that. Uh, where, you know, I've played on a lot of teams that didn't win. And guys would come in the clubhouse, they'd get three or four hits, they'd be satisfied with that day at the office. But uh, that, that was not acceptable to Derek. And you got to see the blossoming of the greatest closer in baseball history, Mariano Rivera. Money. <laughs> what can I tell you? You know, I put my hands in my pockets when I brought him in the game. That was it. I became a fan like the rest of the people in the ballpark. And win, lose, or draw, he was going to be out there and, uh, you know, be that be that guy who you can count on. Um, 
in the game. I remember the one game where I was really resentful, probably the only time I was resentful of the the Met fan. I mean the Met fans, I'm all right. The Yankee fans, when they booed him, uh, I guess it was game, he gave up the lead against Boston or something and will come off the field because I had to take him out of the game and they booed him. And I was resentful of that only because of, you know, how often he was out there and how often, you know, he just walked off in victory. And how about a guy who Jeter was the captain, but I used to feel as if Jorge Posada kind of was a captain in the clubhouse sometimes too, with the way he worked with his pitchers. What stood out about Jorge? Passion. He willed himself, uh, you know, for a guy who struck out a lot and, and, you know, talked a lot and was very animated. Uh, he, he was very uh, reliable when it came to, um, you know, calling a game. And again, that wasn't easy for him. He started out as an infielder. and Normally, catchers really have to have a feel for calling a game. And we've had a lot of conversations over the years when he was, you know, when he was playing because, uh, and, but he would, he would take, uh, you know, take the criticism the way it was meant to try to help. Joe, a couple of my yes colleagues, of course, were former players for you. I need to start out with a guy who I think you loved his fiery nature as much as anyone, Paul O'Neill. Oh, the warrior. I mean, I, I think, I think George Steinbrenner named him perfectly. Uh, you know, he'd bite and scratch. If he had a chance to bite that bat when he made it out, he would do it. Uh, the only thing I ever cautioned Paulie about was if you hurt yourself and you can't play, I'll break your neck. That's all I, I – I'll kill you. And, and things – you know, it may have come out, Jack, but – when he used to come into the dugout after he made an out in the key situation, you know, he'd break a bat, he'd go down underneath and all kinds of noise. And then he'd come up and, and walk by Zim and I, and he'd be mumbling and all that kind of stuff. And then Zim would tell him that, because he'd always say, you know, I stink. I could, you know, I, I should go find a job, blah, blah, blah. And Zim said, you know, there's a cinder block place in Cincinnati. I know they're looking. They, you could really help. And you, I can't tell you, I can't use the words that uh, he would yell at Zim after that. But uh, it was funny. It was funny. Every manager wants to know when he gives the baseball to a starting pitcher that that pitcher is going to give every ounce of his being to try and help a team win. I know that David Cohn fell under that heading for you. That was all about trust right there um if there was ever a man that could will himself to do something um and i'll give you a couple of instances i remember first off you know he was a free agent and you know i i just let it be known how important he would be for us to to re-sign him and then of course he had the aneurysm in spring training and uh you know and it was devastating and but you know, I, I, in 96, when we won, you know, in 96, probably the best decision I made, the biggest decision I made in, uh, in the World Series was to pitch him game three. And I, and I remember, and again, he, you know, he's a superstar. He's a number one pitcher on any staff. And I, I called him in and I explained why I wanted to pitch him in game three. I said, you're the only one that ever pitched in that ballpark. And that could be intimidating to a starter because the ball jumps out of there. And, you know, again, he took that role and got us win number one in 96. And uh, that was huge for us. It really was. And, and then there was, <laughs> I think it was 98, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he was pitching uh, to Cleveland in, in, at home, and we had a, a pretty good lead. And I remember going out when Manny was the hitter, and he said, uh, I'll get this guy. And I turned around and walked right back to the dugout. Manny popped up, uh, but I should have taken him at his word. He said, I'll get this guy. 
and then Tomei hit a grand slam off him, you know. But uh, and then then the one, if there was ever a doubt about trusting him, uh, brought him in in the one run game in 2000 in the World Series, and Denny Nagel, I think, still doesn't talk to me to this day. Two out in the fifth inning, and I just didn't want Nagel to, to pitch the Piazza again, and and Coney cranked it up in the bullpen and come in and razzle-dazzled him and popped him up with like an 85-mile-an-hour fastball. You left one out, Joe. You mentioned the game three in 96, but you had to have a a face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball meeting with him during a tense moment in that oh. game. And he swore oh. to you that, that he was okay. <laughs> said after the game he was lying, but then in my book he said, well, I was lying when I said I was lying. I really believed I could get those guys out. Well, as I said, I, I think he could will himself to do things. And even though he lied to you, he was still going to make find a way to make it, make it come true. Because there's no question, if you ask him how he feels or if, he, if he's all right to pitch to this next guy, he is never going to tell you I've had enough because he's going to, you know, choreograph something for you and uh, – you know, whether it's sidearm, overhand, screwball, whatever the heck he had to make up, he was going to get it done. And uh, David Cohn was was one of a kind when it came to that. Joe, when you see these players, either if it's an entire group of them or if it's individually, do you immediately transport yourself back? Are you back in the clubhouse? Are you back in the dugout? Do those memories just flood forward when you see some of your former Yankee players? Yes. Yeah, that there was there was a closeness that we had that uh, was unparalleled in my career. I know that. I mean, I uh, you know I played with some very special players, but the group as a whole, the unselfishness that we had. Uh, you know, you go back to the first game we played in in the '96 playoffs, and I wasn't sure if I was going to DH. Uh, you know, Strawberry or, or Cecil Fielder and Strawberry walked in the clubhouse and he's, I said, Straw, I got a, an issue here. He's, I, I said, I don't know. I'm going to DH you or Big Daddy. He says, have Big Daddy DH. I can handle sitting on the bench better than he could. Of course, I didn't listen to him. I played Strawberry and he went hitless against Burkett. But uh, that, that's the kind of group I had. 